divinely delivered the lecture on the preamble of the Constitution, the Constitution of the Nation. The Honorable Justice yeah. Sri Sudhirmanian, Judge Sudhirmanian, and the Indian Dr. Cyril Vincent, and my former colleagues as well as students, Dr. Solomon Raja and Srinivasa, my former colleague Vincent Dapulam, and uh, so many other uh, invited guests here. And some of them from the uniform, I infer that you are from law schools or some law colleges. I welcome you. And uh, all of the distinguished friends. And at the outset, I thank my friend and my student, Cyril, for uh, conferring, me, conferring on me this honor and the privilege to come over here and to deliver a lecture. I got an invitation from Cyril and told him that this is a problem of miscarriage. Virtually I was engaged in an advertisement kind of a thing, telling everybody that I am going to Pondicherry just to share the ties with my own student who is now a teacher the Maria Daigo. So in the evening of my life as a teacher, what more I can expect? This is the dividend. This is the, uh, you know, the kind of uh, happiness and the sense of fulfillment when I find that our own, my own students are occupying very exalted positions in different walks of life and uh, there is, uh, I think, the words are not adequate to express my sense of fulfillment and happiness and joy and ecstasy uh, on uh, occasions like this. And friends, uh, uh, my memories go back to the days of, my days in Pondicherry Government Law College. It was in the soil of Pondicherry. I sprouted, grew, and bloomed into a lot easier. It was through the medium of hundreds and hundreds of students of Pondicherry Government Law College. I evolved as a teacher. I always believe that only through the medium of students a teacher evolves. This after all, learning is a joint collaborative endeavor. And the teacher is only a facilitator in the process of learning. So therefore, in that process, that has been our tradition right from the Vedic times. Now therefore, I am uh, filled with happiness when I find that many of my colleagues and all these people are there and uh, I owe a lot to this place, Pondicherry, and also this great institution, Dr. Ambedkar Government Law College, Pondicherry, where I joined in the year of 1978 and left in 1994. Uh, all my formative years uh, I spent here. That was a very, really uh, heartwarming experience. And uh, Mr. Cyril reminded me about the composition of this audience. And I thought that the most of the people in the audience will be the law teachers, law students, and lawyers, and all that. Then he reminded me, you know, there are other students from uh, non law field as well. So it has put me in some difficulty uh, in delivering this uh, lecture. So, to the extent possible, I will minimize the using of legalistic language or other jargon, but nonetheless, uh, it may not always succeed because that is something in which we have trained ourselves in the very hard way. Now, friends, regarding the genesis of the Law Day. Justice Supremanian has explained to you in a very simple way uh, what is Law Day and why Law Day and what is the importance of rule of law, why should we abide by law. All these things have been uh, summarized in uh, one single sentence by the ancient rishis. Dharma rekshadi rekshida. He who protects Dharma will be protected by Dharma. He who destroys dharma will get destroyed by dharma. So that shows our very existence depends on our observance of dharma, that is the law. So time from time immemorial, we have been rooted in this idea. Now of course, the modern version of that we are having with us, and that is the rationale of uh, rule of law, law day. Now, of course, we celebrate it as Constitution Day. 
and the Constitution Day is uh, celebrated as Lord Day after all. Constitution being the mother of all laws. So even if you call it as Lord Day, but, uh, it signifies the Constitution Day because Constitution is the mother of all laws. The 26th day of November 1949, we the people of India, through our Constitution Assembly, adopted, enacted, and gave to ourselves this Constitution. And this adoption of the Constitution signaled the birth of a new era, a epoch in the history of this country. A new twilight, the twilight of uh, not, sun, not evening, but of the morning, as we are in the way I said. And this adoption of the Constitution on 26th November 1949 is, was a culmination of two parallel renaissance that the nation has witnessed. And one renaissance, because this part of history, every student and every citizen should remember. Otherwise, we will not be able to own the Constitution. We will still be under the wrong notion that, as somebody says that, that we have borrowed this thing, that thing from there, and then smuggled to India, and then made our Constitution. It's not so. So all these values of the Constitution have got deep roots in our spiritual genius and the tradition of this country. So that is very important. And then that's why I said that the adoption of the Constitution was a combination of one, a renaissance, a spiritual and cultural renaissance, spearheaded by seven great personalities whom I would, I would like to describe as the sub-rishis, the seven rishis, the sages, the philosophers, spiritual leaders. Look at what, who are they? Dadara Mohan Rai, Dayananda Saraswati, Ramakrishna Narvanamsa, Swami Vivekananda, Devindana Tagore, Mahatma Gandhi, and Sri Aravindu. These are the Sapta Rishis who spearheaded the cultural and spiritual renaissance in this country. And it was in the wake of this spiritual renaissance there came another parallel development in this political history of India, the social and political renaissance, where the large number of freedom struggles, freedom fighters, those who have fighted for the political emancipation of this country, and also a large number of members of the Constitutional Assembly, they were all influenced by this spiritual renaissance. If you want to know that, I am not making a conjecture here. I am saying this after doing a very systematic and candid and honest study and research into that, you please read the writings of Pandit Nehru. How he described all these personalities. How much the freedom fighters and the makers of the constitution owed their intellectual uh, inheritance to these people who were responsible for the cultural and spiritual renaissance which had a tremendous impact and influence on the minds of those who have fought for freedom and those who are responsible for making our constitution. And therefore, it is my firm conviction that there is a spiritual dimension for the constitution. And there is a spiritual foundation on which the constitution stands. And this can be seen if you go through the various speeches in the Constituent Assembly, who openly acknowledged this debt that they owed to this spiritual and cultural license. And this particular dimension of our history should be kept in mind when we take a deep look into the various aspects of the Constitution. Now particularly, I confine myself to the preamble to the Constitution, that was the topic. Therefore. Uh, and, uh, there is no time to dilate and then digress to go into the other uh, aspects of the Constitution. Now, uh, as you know, the process of Constitution making began on 9th December 1946. It was a long standing demand of our freedom standards and our political leaders to have a constituent assembly of our own, consisting of our own people to write the constitution for us. This is a very striking piece of Indian constitution. 
when compared to other commonwealth countries and yesterday's colonies of the British Empire. Look at the Australian constitution, our Canadian constitution. They were drafted by the British Parliament and gifted those documents to them. But Mahatma Gandhi made a declaration that if ever India makes a constitution for herself, it will be made by our own people. And we have been demanding consistently for a constitutional assembly. Finally, it materialized with the cabinet mission plan of 1946, which accepted our demand to have a constitutional assembly. And a constitutional assembly was convened, consisting of elected and nominated members representing the various, various uh, sections of our people. And the making of the constitution, the process started on the 9th of December 1946. And the next huge step in the constitution making was the introduction of the objectives resolution by Pandit Nehru on 13th December 1946. And that objective resolution moved by Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in the constitution assembly has got a very significant uh, importance in our constitution making its history. And the objective resolution was introduced as a foundation for our constitution. This after all, when a new nation is born, when we want to make a fresh start as a new nation, immediately you have to ask the question from where, from there, where we are heading towards. And how to frame our system of governance. And what type of constitution we should have. What are the fundamental objectives that should be achieved through a constitutional document for us. And all of these have been envisioned by none other than Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. And he was, he has, he has ordered the objective resolution and moved it on the 13th of December 1946. And it was passed unanimously with all solemnity, all the members of constitutional standing. And then voted for that because of this extreme significance of that objective resolution. It was passed in uh, 22nd of January 1947. That was the first significant step towards the drafting of India's constitution. And it is this objective resolution which was the intellectual progenitor of the preamble. The preamble as we have it today is the fine-tuned version of the objective resolution moved by Pandit Jawaharlal. And now some of the salient features of the objective resolution is very, very important for us if we want to have an insight into the very spirit and philosophy of the constitution. And I am not uh, going to read the entire thing. Some of the striking features. One thing is that Nehru said in uh, uh, class 4, he said that all the political powers and authorities of the government Various organs of the government, various institutions are derived from the people. So the ultimate political sovereignty is with the people. It is from the people we draw all our forces and all the powers. And that has been made clear in class 4. Then following that in class 5 onwards, he said that the future constitution, we are resolved to secure to all its people justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, and equality of status and of opportunity. And then he referred to, this is an objective situation, he referred to the resort to make special provisions for the minorities, for the scheduled guards, scheduled tribes and the marginalized sections of the society that also found a place in the objective resolution. And then, in spite of the fact that we have been struggling very hard to solve our own problems, to assuage our own feelings. Pandit Nehru did not fail to incorporate into the uh, objective resolution that this ancient land attain its rightful and honored place in the world and makes its full and willing contribution to the promotion of world peace and welfare of mankind. You never imagine that in the situations where the Constitutional Assembly was uh, meeting and the kind of gigantic problems 
which our leaders were confronting, they were also equally anxious as to in what way India can contribute to the world of peace and the prosperity of the mankind. And how best we can regain the rightful place for India, this ancient land. The word used is ancient land. Because never was whether the story of India or his various features in the constant assembly. Three expressions he used very frequently. Five thousand years of India's history, he says. He always feels proud of this ancient land. And then he also refers to all these. You know, all this only indicates the orientation towards the cultural ethos and the traditions and the spiritual genius of this country. Even a progressive leader like Jehovah Nehru was conscious of this fact. He has acknowledged openly, whether it is in his speeches in the Constant Assembly or in his wonderful book, The Discovery of India, what he was trying to discover. He was trying to discover the cultural and spiritual roots of India for the purpose of the future progression of this country. Now, this is the common substance of the objective resolution. And everybody uh, accepted the underlying values and principles in this uh, objective resolution. Then another significant aspect of this is his speech in the Constitutional Assembly while he was moving the objectives of solution. He said that the words which are used in the objectives of solution should not be treated as ordinary legal rules or ordinary legal words. If you are trying to look at it from the perspective of ordinary legal rules, then you will be making a lifeless thing out of this resolution. And he said, this resolution is not law, but something higher than law. This resolution is not law but something that breathes life and spirit into the minds and hearts of the people of this country. Look at the emotional quotient that in his expressions and in his speech in the Constitutional Assembly. And then finally he says, I hope the House will pass a resolution which is of a special nature. It is an undertaking with ourselves, with the millions of our brothers and sisters who live in this great country. If it is passed, it will be a sort of pledge that we shall have to carry out. With this expectation and in this form, I place it before you. Then the entire Constitutional Assembly, without any dissenting voice, they stood up in all solemnity and then passed it on 22nd uh, January 1947. Now, the real actual working of the Constitution and the drafting of the various provisions were all taken place in the light of the guiding principles and values that are embodied in the objective resolution. And then, after having completed the drafting of all the 395 articles, this preamble that we have today was taken up as the last item on the 17th October 1949. Just one month before the adoption of the Constitution. And you would be wondering, after all, the preamble is a preface, an introductory part of the constitution of the law. Normally, it should find a place in the beginning. But what is the rationale in taking up the preamble for its deliberation and for its adoption after completing the drafting of all the provisions in the body of the constitution? What? There is a reason. The members of the Constitutional Assembly wanted to make sure that there, there shall not be any contradiction or conflict whatsoever between anything contained in the body of the Constitution with the fundamental values and principles that are embodied in the preamble. Every single article is expected to be operated so as to facilitate and enable us to realize these values in the preamble. And that was the reason. Just to avoid any kind of after all, when you are dealing, when you are having any problem in reading and understanding the provisions of the Constitution, 
we can take recourse to the preamble and the fundamental values there. So any interpretation of the constitutional provision should be consistent with the goals, the objectives and the values contained in the preamble. So just to ensure that there shall not be any conflict, this preamble was uh, uh, taken up as the last item after completing the drafting of all the provisions of the constitution. And 17 uh, October 1949, this preamble was adopted as part of the constitution. Now friends, uh, let me uh, take you to some of the fundamental values and uh, ideals in the preamble. The characteristic features of the preamble to the constitution of India is, first, the preamble at the outset makes it clear that all the powers are derived from the people as the objective of solution has told you. And we the people of India made this constitution and gave that constitution unto ourselves. So we made the constitution and we keep the constitution. We are the ultimate custodians of the constitution. We did not make the constitution and give it to the parliament so that the parliament do whatever it wants to do. We did not give the constitution, either the Supreme Court or the President of India. We are not prepared to do that. All these are three sides of the constitution. People have created them in order to govern the people in accordance with these fundamental values and principles in the preamble. And now, what are, yeah, of course, now most of you must be knowing that uh, so it was good enough to uh, distribute you the printed text of the preamble. So at least uh, now you will go through it. Now, the preamble, of course, makes it clear that uh, we, the people of India, are the authors of the Constitution and we keep the Constitution with us. We are the ultimate defenders and custodians of the Constitution. That is a very profound statement. And secondly, what for? What are all the things that we are going to achieve through this constitution? As many people say that constitution is a transformational topic. We want to transform ourselves socially, economically, politically through this mighty instrumentality that we call as constitution. But that kind of exercise is not possible. Under the analysis, you have a vision as to the kind of transformation, transformation that you will undertake. And the preamble provides you the vision for all the transformation that you may attempt through this constitution. And we have resolved, then we have resolved to, serve, to accomplish certain things in the preamble. We resolved to constitute India in their sovereign democratic government. And democracy is not merely a political or a legal principle. As J.P. Krugalani, one of the prominent members, uh, the very scholarly member in the Constitutional Assembly, while participating on the deliberations, on the preamble, he referred to each and every one of these ideals in the preamble. And he said and claimed, he asserted, that all these values are not mere constitutional principles or legal principles. They are spiritual principles, ethical principles, moral principles. Even democracy, he says, is a moral principle. Rooted in non-violence. In democracy, we don't break heads. We cow heads in order to solve those problems, isn't it? In other systems, we will uh, break heads in order to solve our problems. Democracy is not. It is rooted in non-violence. We cow heads and then solve the problem of some And democracy, of course, many of the students are here even from non-government. Democracy implies two things, my friends and friends. One thing, of course, is a form of government, a majority form of government. A mere form of government will not make democracy a meaningful thing. It is also a way of life.
And of course, we have no other way but to accept the decisions of the majority or the rule of the majority for the time being. Even if I don't agree with the majority decision, I am under a moral obligation to agree to that, even though I accept that, even though I don't agree with that. What is the moral justification for me to agree to something which I don't like? The only justification is that I am guaranteed certain civil and political rights, as Justice has said. In exercise of which, I can transform the minority opinion to which I belong today into a majority opinion of tomorrow in an orderly and peaceful way. Once you have been given that freedom, then you have to as a moral obligation in the world. And of course, this, the, our democracy is not merely a majoritarian regime. The majority rule is reconciled with minority rights. And uh, that is why Trubilani has claimed that this democracy is a moral principle that we have posited at the right in the, the threshold of the constitution, the PAC. And democracy has to be understood in that broader sense. It is not a question of an election conducted in five years, lining up before the polling booth and casting a vote. No, it is not the only thing. There are many other significant underlying ideas in a democratic form government. It is that wider sense you should try to understand how bizarre to constitute India into a democratic republic. It's a republic because people participate and people decide who should go into government. And it is our sovereign because I, we don't take any dictates from any other foreign states. We decide our issues, we decide those problems, and we don't accept any political superior to us. Only in that limited sense, we can understand that is uh, sovereign democratic republic. And then we resolve to secure to all our people, to all our citizens, justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, faith, belief, and worship. Equality of status and of opportunity. So, justice, liberty, equality. All these are again moral principles, spiritual principles. All these things are attributed to what is called as the dignity of the individual, the modern version of the ancient divinity, the doctrine of divinity of man. Every human being is an embodiment of the divine spark. It is in recognition of that we want to secure to all other people the human dignity and the, all the freedoms that follow that goes out of that. Then equality of status and opportunity as well as we have resolved to promote fraternity. And this equality and fraternity again is a moral principle. Without it, it cannot be a foundation, it cannot have a foundation. As the Ishavasa Upanishad says, Ishavasa Vidam Sarva. That's a universal declaration of the dignity of man as well as the, the spiritual equality and fraternity of man. What is the idea of fraternity? Other than this, we, are, we, we can understand that we are all the common, uh, come from a common stock. We are all children of God. That's why we, brothers and sisters, are fraternal beings. That's what we have to spread and create in the society. So that is not a spiritual foundation. Uh, it is a moral principle. Otherwise, we cannot have a sound foundation on which these concepts can exist and uh, for, uh, for a long time. And then, of course, after resolving to secure to all its people justice, liberty, equality, and the promote of among all the people for today, it says that assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. Unity and integrity are both one and the same. When it comes to justice, liberty and equality, we use the word, we resort to sequire to all these people. But when it comes to the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation, we use a different word, that is, assure, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. Of course, the great leaders 
men of wisdom who drafted the constitution clearly understood the difference between secular and ashur. <coughs> secular means to put beyond the hazard of losing or to relieve from any exposure to danger. All this justice, liberty and equality should be put beyond any possible danger and therefore we have to secure it by appropriate provisions of the constitution. Having done that, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. There, assure means to make <coughs> sure and certain which makes dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation, if I may say so, are as non derogatory values of the reality. They are, they are the two non-negotiable values of the reality. <coughs> we cannot compromise with these two ideals in the preamble, the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. All the fundamental rights, all the human rights, justice, liberty, these are all delineations and these are all emanations from the core concept of the dignity of the individual. That's a very profound concept if you think about that. All these fundamental rights, all these human rights are nothing but emanations from this core concept of the dignity of man, which is a moral principle. And then the unity of nation. We shall not do anything which will endanger, which will compromise with the unity and the integrity of the country. If Mother India perishes, who's our, who's our wives? We have been taught and we have been singing right from the Vishnu Purana's right. Jenani Jatna Bhumicha Sangya Adhani Giriyasi And I am prepared to sacrifice even the heaven for the sake of my mother and motherland. This is a tradition. This is a conviction with which our, on, the, on the basis of which our culture evolved and our civilization manifested. Therefore, there is no doubt, there is no wonder that the preamble found gave a very important and prominent place for the unity and integrity of the country, which is non derogable which is non-negotiable. The entire constitution, even the entire preamble can be subsumed under the rubric of these two, the dignity of the individual and unity and integrity of the nation. You can take anything, entire fundamental is everything. You can relate to the dignity of the individual. You look at the body of the constitution. You are having parliamentary form of government, but you put check and limitations on the parliament, unlike the British parliament, which can make an unmitigated law. Our parliament cannot. It is a constitutional democracy. And uh, you take, for example, the federal structure. Our uh, flexible federation, as Dr. Ambedkar said, with a strong center. That's a deliberate choice that we have made. That can be understood only in the perspective of, from the perspective of this assurance of the dignity, uh, sorry, the unity and integrity of the country. Whatever is required for preserving the unity and integrity of the country, we have incorporated adequate provisions in the constitution while creating various institutional structures in the constitution. We are organizing the political power in the constitution in a particular way. What was uppermost in the mind of our people, mind of the Protestant Assembly was how best we can preserve and protect and safeguard and assure the unity and integrity of the country. Many times I find that when people talk about the federal structure and all that, they make a human cry, pointing out these are all various unitary features directing the federal principle. They are still overtaken by the ghost of A.C. Mayer, who defined federalism. That is the Bible for us. India made a constitution to solve the problems of India. India did not make a constitution to solve the problems of the Americans. Australians have made a constitution to solve their problems. Why are you expecting a regimented uniformity? India had its own problems. We made a constitution and that constitution was made by men of wisdom who could feel the pulse of the nation who could understand the deep spiritual values of the system. They made the constitution. And they made a strong center in our federation. And all these unitary features, to my mind, is the features that are required 
to fortify and strengthen the unity of the country. Unity in diversity is the operating principle, the philosophical threat which runs through the entire constitutional fabric. So therefore, there is a profound meaning and importance that you have to attach to these two words, that is the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. And then, of course, as I told you, we gave the Constitution and all this. Now, speakers after speakers in the Constitutional Assembly, while participating on the debates on uh, the, the preamble, as I told you, either the J.B. Kruppelani, or at least the last one, you can go to the library and take the, the well-documented Constitutional Assembly debates. It is a hours of knowledge, wisdom, and information. Then you will get to know all these things. Has we come up, for instance. And uh, he says, people of India will not forget our spiritual genius and our ancient tradition. He quotes Swami Vivekananda, the day we discard India's spiritual genius and spirituality, that day will be the day of our doom. I am not saying it, Swami Vivekananda said. That was quoted in the Constitutional Assembly, attributing all these uh, ideas in the preamble to our cultural roots in this country. And uh, another prominent member in the Constitutional Assembly, Thakur Das Bhargava, he said that the preamble is the most precious part of the Constitution. And he said the preamble is the soul of the Constitution. And all the 395 articles have to be measured with the yardsticks of the preamble. Only those articles which will stand up in the preamble are worthy of being rewritten. If there are any provisions of the constitution which will not stand up to the preamble, throw it away. They are lifeless, they are meaningless. So that is the kind of importance given to the preamble. And all of these ideals and principles they are treated as moral values, spiritual values, ethical values. Moral presence are to be linked. Only the living things are here in life. Now, friends, uh, when uh, I say that all the values and principles in the prayer, you know, the constitute what I call as a value portion. That is very much there in the preamble. That has got, that, that all of them are Indian and indigenous. All these ideals, we did not borrow or smuggle from the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the American Declaration of Independence. But at the very same time, I should tell you that's not my topic. When it came to the organization of the political power, when it comes to the institutional structures that we have provided in the constitution, the parliamentary democracy, how to organize the parliament, how to compose the two houses of parliament, what to be the president, prime minister, and parliament, there are many things we have taken from the experiences of other liberal democracies. In fact, there was no hesitation on the part of our people to accept, to receive, to absorb, and to assimilate anything that is good which they come across. So they observe the constitutional experiences which other liberal democracies have. Therefore, we adopted the parliamentary reform in England and we adopted the technique of the Bill of Rights and joined with the doctrine of judicial review. We have adopted a federal structure in our own way, which will uh, satisfy our requirements. In all of these things, there is no doubt that we have borrowed, we have adopted the systems which were there elsewhere. And we have never been exclusive, we have been inclusive. Right from the rhetoric period, it said, let us keep open all the, the windows on all four sides so that the wisdom may come to us from all sides. This, is, this has been our view right from the beginning. So therefore we did not have any hesitation to accept 
something from other systems, if they are good. But even when we adopted such system, the parliament reform or any other thing, we have adopt, done so with necessary modifications which will suit to our requirements and conditions. So anyway, uh, that's not uh, my topic. Now, as many of you must be wondering why this old man has missed two important expressions in the preamble. Is it because of his fading poor memory? Are due to inadvertence? Are due to hangs? How dare he is to take the liberty to omit two crucial words in the preamble? Yes, friends, I did it deliberately. It's my conviction, my view, which you need not accept. The two words which I omitted in the preamble is secular and socialist. And uh, of course it is a very ticklish issue. Uh, why? And not in a situation or in a kind of condition to utter these. This is a very memorable occasion. We are celebrating the Constitution Day today. Why should I utter an act? Why should you make an utter lie in front of you? What is the text? We, the people of India, have solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. And then the sovereign thing. On this 26th day of November 1949, we hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this constitution. Is it not a lie? On 26th November 1949, we, the people of India, did not resort to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic. On 26 November 1949, we, the people of India, have resolved only to establish a sovereign, democratic republic. Until it was so, why should I utter a lie on this all occasion? Satyameva Jayade is our motto. On the very front of the constitution, an after lie, declaring the whole world of that lie. Why should we do that? That is one reason why I did not read that. As a piece of information, you please, you have to read. I have no authority, moral or legal, in asking you to refrain from reading the preamble uh, in its uh, completeness. But I did not want to make sin, that's it, by telling you a lie on your face, saying that on 26th November 1949, we resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic. We did not do that. Now, another uh, reason in this context is the very entry of these two expressions in the preamble are clandestine. And that democratic legitimacy. These two expressions were interpolated into the preamble, smuggled into the preamble, throw back though, during the demise of democracy in India, during the dark days of emergency, which witnessed the demise of democracy. Only thing is that what is the amendment was enacted in the parliament building. The members of the parliament were languishing in jail. So the very amendment by which these words were included in the preamble lacked democratic legitimacy and propriety. And thirdly, the interesting part is that these two very expressions were introduced in the Constitutional Assembly by the proposing the various uh, amendments proposed by some of the members of the Constitution. They criticized uh, Dr. Ambedkar and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru very severely. They said that the word secular should find a place in the preamble.
Let us say, it is not possible. Because India is a land of religions. Every religion in the world is having their abode in our country. With open arms we receive every religion. We gave shelter and refuge for the people who were persecuted in, in their own land. We welcomed them. We allowed them all the freedom and bear with us to, to practice their religion, to profess their religion, to propagate their religion. Indian society is religious in its core. 5,000 years of history will tell you what is the kind of spiritual inheritance that we have. In such a country, when we make a constitution, how can you do this kind of a hypocritic thing? How, how do you uh, include the word secularism? We don't want to do that. And uh, what is the guiding principle in our system is equal respect for all religions. Not mere slogan. We live that principle. Our history is giving equal respect for every religion in this country. And sufficient provisions were made in the Constitution, Article 25 to 28 will tell you. And three significant words have been used to preempt itself. Freedom of thought, expression, faith, belief and worship. No other thing. Three words were used in the preamble itself. That shows our concern. So far as the religion's freedom is concerned. 25, 26. Guaranteed right, religious freedom. In such a country, in such a constitution, how do you uh, include this secularism? Secularism is something relating to the worldly and temporal, not overtly religious. Secularism is an attitude and a principle, indifference to, or rejection, or exclusion of religion or religion. This is the meaning of the word secularism. And now, if we ask our politicians, they will say, no, no, secularism in India means it is an equal respect for all this. But you cannot change arbitrarily the meaning of English words. You cannot separate the word from its meaning. Just like you cannot separate the fragrance from the flower. Can you separate? Similarly, you cannot separate the meaning from its word. Secularism means the same thing in India, America, and Australia. How can the political class can take the privilege of giving new meaning to the English word secularism? That is because they knew that if they give that meaning, it will not stand, it will not hold any water. Therefore, uh, they make a somersault and say that no, 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 secularism in India means equal also. Then how they been done? Then another creature, socialism. Never was severely criticized the constitution. He was an adult student of Karl Marx, a follower of Marx. And he was a student of Harold Lasky. And he was a proclaimed Fabian socialist. But socialism is not to be seen in the preamble, which he honored. Then many people raised questions. He even questioned the intellectual integrity of Pandit Nehru and all that. He said that. We are not going after political slogans and dogmas. What is required in this country is to secure social justice and economic justice to our people. Adequate provisions have been made in part 3 and part 4 of the constitution. In order to secure social justice and economic justice to our people, we do not want to mortgage India to any inflexible or legit economic dogmas. On that ground, they refused to include socialism in the prayer. The point is that these two expressions were raised in the assembly. It was subjected to very detailed and deliberate discussion. And after deliberating upon that, consciously, they refused to include these two words in the prayer. 
It was these two words, it was smuggled into the preamble and thrown back to by the conscious of That the notorious part of the end of the And then, friends, now look at the irony. That is why the men of wisdom did not include anything confusing or conflicting in the preamble. You please go by every other ideal in the preamble. They have got indigenous roots. They are rooted in our spiritual genius. They are having a moral foundation. They are essentially Bharatiya or Indian. There are only two expressions which are foreign to our culture. Secular Southern Socialism. And I am talking about the concept. Now, the irony is this. Again, it's a huge embarrassment for us. In the preamble, you proclaim to the entire world, we are establishing a socialist republic. What do you practice today? So you have got socialism in the preamble and capitalism on ground. There is an outright contradiction between what you profess and preach through your preamble and then what you do. Socialism is a bygone theory. Nobody accepts that. No, it is not a saleable commodity anymore. Fifty years, we have experimented with market for the planned economy and the socialistic policies. Eagle. What happened? The entire world has refused even to give loan. So our people have taken all the gold from the reserve bank and went to IMF for loan. So thanks to the magnanimity and sagacity of uh, Narasimha Rao and uh, Anmohan Singh, a minority government, brought about a turnaround. See, maximization of national wealth is our priority. If your coffers are empty, what social injustice and economic justice you will do? So if you are sincere and serious about securing social justice and economic justice, your coffers will be fully, your treasury will be fully. You should have sufficient national wealth. If it is not possible through socialist route, come on, you go along with the capitalist route for that investment. Now look at where it just stands. So the point is this. Such conflicting principles, contradicting principles, were not allowed to be there in a prayer. But unfortunately, through this uh, 42nd Amendment Act, they amended the preamble. And then these two words were included. Let us prove to be counterproductive and embarrassing. If anybody reads our preamble and look at our uh, economic system, they will laugh at us. Again, you are telling a lie in the preamble. That's another point. This is not associated with legal or conscious. It's a common sense. Now, one more point with that I will conclude. See, this kind of a situation could have been avoided. If the Honorable Supreme Court in Keshavananda Bharati's case <coughs> decided that the preamble was not amended. In fact, Rene Palkewala has argued very vehemently that the preamble should be treated as unamended. Under Article 368, the parliament shall not have any power to amend the preamble. It is quite right. The preamble is the soul of the constitution, we say. And Article 1 to 395 is the body of the constitution. All the changes you can make only in the body, not in the soul. Soul is eternal, indestructible, immutable. All these changes can take place only in the body. Every cell in my body continues to change. Very nearly. But still, I remain. This is it. So, nothing can be done to That is our idea. That is our spiritual truth. 
as the Lord Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, Nainam Chandundi Sastani, Nainam Dagari Bhavara, Nainam Kledyandi Yaku, Nesoshayari Bhavara. About the soul he says, it cannot be injured by vapor, it cannot be burned by fire, it cannot be drenched by water, it cannot be dried by air. It is immutable, it is eternal. And every member of the constitution is really described the preamble as the soul of the constitution. The entire constitution, the body of the constitution, consisting of the and the are the vehicles, are the instrumentalities, are the means to achieve the ends. The ends being the ideas in the preamble. But unfortunately, in that particular case, the Supreme Court did not accept any Balkirala's argument. And uh, uh, it was here that under Article 368, the power of Vietnam and even the preamble. So it was that which, even otherwise, uh, during the emergency, they would have done it. But there was a legal ground for that. Now, regarding the amendability of this preamble, again, is a very intriguing point. Why the preamble should remain unamended? Even by the logic of the Supreme Court itself. Now, in terms of first principles, I am telling you, according to those, uh, there are uh, no, students other than doctors, please excuse me. Uh, see, uh, in Kesavananda, the Supreme Court said that, of course, the parliament has got legal powers to amend any of the provisions of the constitution. Provided no such amendment will result in damaging or destroying the basis structure. Justice Karna said that the identity of the constitution shall not be changed by any amendment by under Article 368 of Parliament. Then, what is the identity of the constitution? Again, Justice Karna said that the identity of the constitution consists in the basic structure of the constitution. Then, what consists of the basic structure? Basic structure consists of certain basic features of the constitution. They are the identification marks of the constitution. And then the court proceeded and said, and also in various subsequent cases, the Supreme Court was said, the basic features of the constitution are not amendable. Proposition number one. Where from we get the basic features? So far, the Supreme Court has delineated and derived each and every one of these basic features from the preamble. So, preamble seems to be the source from which all these basic features are derived and these basic features are ornamented. That is a logical fallacy. The basic features which are derived from the preamble are unamendable. How can the very source, the preamble, from which we get the uh, basic features are amendable? It will be very difficult to agree with that proposition. Preamble is the very source from which you get all your basic features. Then the Supreme Court says that the basic features are unamendable. <coughs> then how can the preamble is amendable? It is from the preamble you got all your basic features. Now, even with reference to, you know, there is some textual justification on it. See, article, the, the preamble says that we have solemnly resolved to suit India and all these things and adopt, enact, and give unto ourselves this constitution. And then the constitution follows. And the preamble does not form part of this constitution. The preamble is part of the constitution, but the preamble is not part of this constitution. That's my point. And you read Article 360. The Parliament may, in exercise of its constituent power, amend by way of repeal, uh, operation or changes, any of the provisions of the Constitution. Any of the provisions of this Constitution alone comes under the Parliament's power under Article 360. And by no stretch of imagination, you can say that the preamble is a provision in the Constitution. As Nehru said, it is not law, it is something higher than law. 
It is something that breathes life and spirit into the mind of the people. And all these provisions of the Constitution are only for the purpose of realizing these goals and principles and ideals in the Constitution. And this Constitution consisting of Articles 1 to 3, 95, only comes within the amending power, of the, within the reach of the amending power of the Parliament. The preamble is not a provision in the Constitution. And Parliament has got power only to amend the provisions of this Constitution. Parliament does not come within that terras and the wisdom of the position. And this spirit, voice, and the wisdom has come down to us through an unbroken chain of sages and rishis, including Mahatma Gandhi and Sri Aurobindo. And we have to live by them, and we have to respect them, we have to promote them, we have to live by those that spirit, wisdom, and vision. Not only for the sake of our own people, but also for the salvation for the entire human race. And in this context, I will conclude my speech by quoting the words of two great personalities, one from the West and the other from the East, from Pondicherry itself. Now, Dr. Alma joined me after surveying the story of the entire human race and this to say. And he says, and I quote, It is already becoming clear that a, cha a chapter which had a Western beginning will have to have an Indian ending if it is not to end in self-destruction of the human race. At the supremely dangerous moment in human history, the only way of salvation for mankind is the Indian way, Emperor Ashoka's and Mahatma Gandhi's principle of non-violence and Sri Ramakrishna's testimony in harmony of religions. We have had we here, we have an attitude and spirit that can make it possible for the human race to grow together into a single family. And in the atomic age, this is the only alternative to destroying ourselves. Echoing our Upanishadic statement, Asadayana Kudundu. And in the same way, Sri Aurobindo, the poet of patriotism, a prophet of nationalism, the lover of humanity, as he are lost as described. And he had this to say, a prophetic words. And Sri Aurobindo said, India of the ages is not dead, nor has she spoken her last creative word. She lives and there's still something to do for herself and the human race. And an institution which stands in the name of that great Rishi, Sri Aurobindo, for a higher level of consciousness. That's the common substance of the Indian philosophy and spirituality. Consciousness is the only thing which manifests itself into the entire universe that we perceive. And a higher level of consciousness is the salvation for all of us, not only for the individual, but also for the nation. And friends, I wish you all the very best. And also again, I thank Dr. Guru. And also, I thank Jessica Guru for sharing his time to share the platform with me and uh, making me proud and privileged to trust in your care. I know the answer, I will answer. Or else I will further study and uh, understand it and then convey it to Cyril and see he will.